the next lecture, the fourth lecture, is by Dr. Kirti Bandara Jurvala, BBS Colombo, MD Colombo. He's a board certified cardiac electrophysiologist at National Hospital Canteen. He entered the prestigious Colombo Medical Faculty in 20, uh, 2003 and graduated in 2009 after completing school education in Maliadeva College, Kurunagar, even more prestigious. He was I'm a product of Maliadeva College, Kurunagar. I'm happy to have at least one Maliadeva College, Kurunagar person in Colombo Medical Faculty. He trained at NHSL for the entirety of internship and MD medicine. After obtaining MD from PJN, he underwent extensive training at the Institute of Cardiology, National Hospital Sri Lanka, and followed a well structured training program in cardiac electrophysiology conducted by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Colombo. He was offered a cardiac rhythm management fellowship from the prestigious Royal Cuthbert Hospital, Cambridge Biophysical Campus, UK. The Cambridge Biophysical Campus is the largest center in the medical research and health science in Europe. He stayed two years in UK and decided to come back. Upon his return, he served at Teaching Hospital Kurnan for almost a year before taking up the consultant post in NH Canteen. His main area of research interests are sudden cardiac death and syncope in addition to cardiac electrophysiology. His lecture today is Making Sense of Syncope. Dr. Keith Bandar Dula. Thank you, Chairperson, sir, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, very good afternoon to you all. I see uh, some of my teachers in here as well. Uh, and it brings a lot of uh, memories. Uh, being at NHSL uh, since I left the NHSL, it seems like it has transformed into a premier uh, institute in Sri Lanka with a lot of infrastructure development. It's happy to be back in home, homely feeling. Uh, so my penultimate speaker who spoke about the brain heart uh, syndrome has made my life easier. So. I will build up on that and uh, try to bring you about more applications. So one of the important manifestations of brain heart syndrome is the syncope. So uh, let's uh, start with the presentation. So you might wonder, I'll start talking about death uh, to take a you know approach. Uh, it's interesting that uh, George Ludberg is an American physician who uh, try to define, and we all have to understand, we all die at one day. So death is not the enemy. The human death is normal. We all die. But the real enemy is actually the premature death, disability, the human suffering, and the prolongation of, uh, of dying. The, all the rest is mostly noisy. So according to the WHO, uh, any, if anyone were to die before age of 70, it's considered as a premature death. So the mark, the most, uh, at least one fifth of premature deaths are caused by the sudden cardiac death. And uh, it has a big definition. This was basically adapted from Brown World Heart Disease textbook. Can, uh, see that uh, it's natural death due to a cardiac cause and herald by uh, abrupt loss of consciousness. That is where syncope stand for. Uh, so that is where the link between uh, death and the sudden cardiac death and the syncope. Now, before we start with the presentation, I'll bring up some cases to make it interesting. So this is about a 20 year old male uh, who was apparently been a hotelier and decided to leave the country. And he came to me before leaving the country because he was having disease spells. And all these wordings are important. Recurrent and brief disease spells. Remember in Sri Lankan context, people means several things. So Kalante, Karakilla, Vatanoa, so various, fit taker, so various terms. So you have to be careful when you interpret those things. We'll get back to that in a moment. 
So brief disease spells in all postures. This is an important word in all postures. That means it gets symptoms like flat, stay up on hit feet and, and walk around. And it gets sleep disturbances and that comes with chest pain and nocturnal sweating. And denies having a significant medical history, family history of not feeling ill. And he had received, taken several sport ECGs, which has only shown sinus tachycardia. He never had symptoms when the ECG was taken. So that's an important thing that uh, you always have to verify what were the symptoms when you interfere, interpret the ECG. Then uh, we ordered the halter. That is a 24 hour ambulatory ECG. Uh, so we, so I'll leave this for a few seconds. So uh, try to come up with an, diagnosis for this thing and we will uh, at the end of the presentation we'll get back to these things we'll try to understand so the second case happened to a colleague of us a house officer who was working as a genetops ho and he had a drop attack during labor room duty and as for easy was just taken there had been a couple of premature ventricular complexes apart from Rest is normal, denied having any significant past medical history or family histories. So he was, for the good, observed in an ICU and a halter was hooked. And this is what is recorded. So we'll get back to that as well. So, third case the 17 year old girl who had been having recurrent blackouts and brief unresponsiveness and rigidity at classroom and at the school ground. She had received several ECGs, echo, holders, ECG are all normal. Then we decided to do a tilt table test. So you can see that the tilt table test is a test that we do. We'll discuss that in a late, uh, later slides to come in. So she was put back on the table and it was tilted. You can see to begin with the heart rate is towards low side, the blood pressure was uh, also lower side and and she was put on the tilt position, heart rate has gone up, and all of a sudden, then started to come back, and she became a sister on the tilt. So this was ECG, and, and you can see, appreciate, I'm not sure it's very clear, that her, her rhythm has resumed. So the fourth case is an, about an eight-year-old female who experienced recurrent drop attacks. Mind you, she had injured herself a couple of times, uh, during dining, that's a very important thing. It was happened only when she was eating at the table. She has been receiving treatment for hypertension. Multiple ECG was taken, all normal, and two years was normal. Then she had a whole attack. So this period, she developed syncope. We'll get that back to you tomorrow. So the, the outline of my presentation, we will try to define syncope and, and the terms that are adjacent to it. And we'll talk about uh, assessment in brief and try how to restratify these patients. And if time permits, the common causes and treatment, and we'll get back to the ECCGs as well. So I want to introduce this term, this transient loss of consciousness syncope. They are synonymous. They are two different terms. And we'll talk about it. So when do you call it an event as a transient loss of consciousness? It is a what? Well, a state where a patient's experience real or apparent loss of consciousness with loss of awareness. The patient will be normally amnesic for the period and that can be extended in a retrograde or integrate fashion. Patient normally has abnormal motor control and patient will be unresponsive and it lasts for a short duration. And syncope falls into part of it and remember this is an important practical aspect when you get a t lock or transfer loss of consciousness it can come in two ways patient comes with non-traumatic scenario as well as a traumatic scenario so this is an important lesson even for our surgical colleagues the patient who has a medical condition might end up having a traumatic t lock and they have to remember that this has to be investigated so not all uh, t locks are syncope. Uh, syncope is part of it, and epileptic seizures are the important thing. People can have psychogenic, and there can be rare other causes that might mimic syncope. 
So when a T-lock happen due to a, this is basically pathophysiological um, description, when a T-lock or the transient loss of functions happen due to cerebral hyperperfusion, it is called syncope. So normally it happens in a rapid fashion and last for a short duration and the spontaneous complete recovery. This is where it distinct from cardiac arrest. Now this happens in a, uh, in, in a, especially in, with our anesthesia colleagues who apparently been monitoring these patients, especially in a surgical or a theater setup or an ICU setup, you would see a patient going into cardiac you know, asystole. And uh, I mean, we don't wait until the patient recover. It is our reflex that we intervene at patients uh, those who are destined to recover on their own, still we intervene them. And the, the mistake we do is we label them as cardiac arrest. So we get a lot of referrals from anesthetic colleagues who are apparently having syncope, but had been a witness event and they have intervened it. So make it cardiac arrest. So it, it is going to be a you know, mark on that patient that every time when the patient is supposed to get something done, this cardiac arrest come into the picture and making it more difficult. So this, the important distinctives from cardiac arrest is where uh, the syncope recovers spontaneously. And in syncope, you can have a systolic. So syncope, you can have a systolic. So that does not mean that it is cardiac arrest. So why it happens? So if the heart stops for more than six to eight seconds, your conscious will be lost. So remember that if you interpret an ECG with having you know, two second, three second pause, that might, should not theoretically cause syncope because the brain can maintain its function six to eight seconds. And this might extend beyond that if you are lying flat or sleeping. So if the heart stops for six to eight seconds in an upright position, you should have a syncope. The same way, if the blood pressure drop at a below a critical value, and you can see that 50 to 60 at heart level or th less than 45 at brain level in upright position, it makes you syncopic. So as we know that the, from our physiological days, the systolic blood pressure is a product of cardiac output and moderate peripheral resistance. So if anyone goes wrong or in isolation or in combination, it should produce syncopic. So there can be various situations, circumstances where the cardiac output drops. These are all self-explanatory. And the cardiac, uh, total peripheral resistance can drop in, the, in various scenarios as well. So the important thing is we have to keep an open mind that in many occasions, the syncope is caused by more than one mechanism. So why do we need to talk about it? And as we know, one of the you know, supreme uh, uh, pleasure of being a human is the ability or the accomplishment to feel that you have the control over yourself and the, all the rest. That is the major reason for, for a person to become a politician as well, or being a head of an institution. Because you feel, you feel that pleasure that you have the control over others and you have everything under your control. And syncope is where you lose your control for even for a brief moment. And that can be very scary moment in your life. And not all that, it can be a lethal. So optimal evaluation in syncope can be remain controversial. And evaluation and treatment are expensive and then this is something I want to highlight that people are more care about epilepsy than syncope. Thanks to you know uh, our neurological colleagues have initiated a big, significant big awareness program of epilepsy. All most of our patients come to our center called So which is actually not true. So most of these syncope patients apparently being under neurologist care, most of them have put on antiepileptics as well. So the awareness about syncope is somewhat lacking compared to epilepsy. And not all, and syncope can be calante, can be taken very lightly as well. So most of these patients may not actually come to the treatment. The unfortunate truth is that the so-called innocent syncope could be a 
early manifestation of something sinister and some of these patients will die even before reaching the hospital. So it's important that uh, these data from uh, Western world, uh, one in five deaths uh, in 20 to 80 years of age happened due to cardiac arrest caused by ventricular arrhythmias. That's a significant burden. And, and it is important to highlight that even at the, in affluent countries, if an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest happened, the chance of you being alive is less than 10%. So this is why we need to talk about it a bit more. And apart from being bad, syncope can have a significant impact to your life as an individual, as a family, as a society, and as to the workforce and economic. So, and this is an important thing that one has to understand. If you develop a syncope, if 100 patients develop syncope who come to the a and &E, if you, if you observe them for 30 days, 11 people would either die or have a serious cardiac or non-cardiac outcome. So it's important, it's important that we take syncope seriously. So how common it is, you can see it's a bimodal and uh, the, the highest prevalence generally happens uh, before age of 20. A lot of ch children come with syncope and then it gradually drops and become lowest when you reach normally at the chance of having a syncope, lowest when you reach 50 and started to climb up again. So it's a good chance that 50% of you in here would experience a syncope in your lifetime, at least one. So syncope and epilepsy, this has been going on for ages and ages. So my take on this is very simple. Uh, fit will not rule out syncope. Not having a fit will not rule out epilepsy. So keep an open mind. If there's no specific or uh, sensitive clinical or uh, features that would discriminate from one another, has 100% sensitivity. So there can be several conditions that might confuse you with syncope. So I'm not going to discuss these things in detail. Uh, so let's move from that into the diagnostic evaluation and the stratification of syncope. So there are a few questions one has to answer if you come across a patient. So remember that get, get rid of this habit of calling syncope or epilepsy. So go ahead with t lock transient loss of consciousness. And you first decide, is that traumatic or not traumatic? And once you decide that, is it syncope? So you need to go back to your diagnosis. And, and then can there be an etiological diagnosis? And will that patient have a high-risk cardiovascular outcome? So a detailed history taking is the key. Uh, you have to take detailed information related to that index event. I normally ask, how are the maker of name? Why do I hit it? Mokad the character hit it? Mokad do I in the gun of the hit again hit it? So you ask all that detail because it tell you that good history may will will take you to the right diagnosis. And it's important that uh, if you are lucky enough, get the eyewitness account as well and take a detailed history about the past medical history. And most importantly, never forget about asking the family history. Certain cardiac deaths are commoner than you think. And unfortunately, uh, in a forensic medicine, we, and we aren't that much linked to one another. It's important that we should have a proper link with the forensic medicine to the one who do autopsy. There should be a feedback coming up. So if you see, if you, you will surprise, get, get surprised if you ask a detailed family, see there can be several, a lot, uh, you know, it's not so uncommon to have a sudden cardiac death in anyone's family. So find that amount, try to get down the autopsy detail and verify exactly what has happened because it can have a significant bearing. In Sri Lankan setup, we see a lot of Bugada patients, uh, hypertrophic cardiac is so common in this, this country. And uh, so ischemic cardiac are so common, so sudden cardiac deaths are not uncommon. So pay attention to that. Premature death, 
and even ask about uh, un unexpected, unexpected road traffic death, accidents, drowning, so-called fits. Make sure that you get the detailed history about those. And the physical examination must be thorough and should take include taking supine and standing blood pressure measurement. And ECG is basic, and depending on the cases, you may have to uh, seek for specialist evaluation. So what causes syncope? Basically, the half of syncope you would experience is caused by orthostatic hypertension. And the rest of the half is either caused by reflex syncope or cardiac. So reflex syncope causes a major part. So there can be various uh, conditions that you know, fall into what we call reflex syncope. The, the pro pro proper technical term is called neurocardio inhibitory reflex syncope. So they could have orthostatic vasovagal, there can be emotional and carotid sinus syndrome, and there can be a lot of triggered or situational syncopies. So micturition, defecation syncopies, and, uh, and cough-related syncope, four sections, various. Then you have your orthostatic hypertension, could be androgenic, uh, drug-induced, so it could be due to the simpler volume depletion, so primary or secondary autonomic failures. Cardiac, you can have arrhythmias at one day, and then you have structural abnormalities causing syncope and great vessels like pulmonary embolism. So it's important that you take a detailed history. I will, will probably not run through all of this, that you, know, you can get a lot of clues from the history. Now, suppose a patient who develops syncope in supine position, awake, arrhythmia, even vasovagal due to pain, or can happen. During sleep, epilepsy, both epilepsy and arrhythmia, especially Mugara syndrome, uh, they develop uh, arrhythmias in, during sleep. And if, a, if it happens in sitting, mostly vasovagal or even orthostatic arrhythmias is possible, standing for some period. So, so defining all, the, taking all this detail is going to help you to define. And it is important to find out exactly the trigger. Uh, so you need to take a deep, detailed history in order to get that thing. So these are self-explanatory. And having palpitation, remember, does not rule out. It's, it can be due to the arrhythmia, but even vasovagal syncope. The initial stage, you would get the palpitation before you passed out. So fever, remember the vasovagal syncope and, and Brugada syndrome, patients can develop arrhythmias in fever. And uh, if someone is there to witness the patient and is able to you know, collaborate with you, so you may ask these informations and uh, that might help you. But remember, none of these things are, you know, that is a very, uh, you know, um, I adrenergic environment, even for the eyewitness, so our people aren't trained to you know, help out patients who collapse. So, and uh, so they might not be able to tell you more detail. But if you are lucky enough, then these things might help you. So I'm telling these all these things because uh, you know uh, epilepsy and syncope sometimes it can be quite challenging to different. So keep an open mind, look from both sides, so you will not miss anything. So remarks, uh, so all form of syncope are more likely to occur or more severe if you have, you know, vasoactive medications causing low blood pressure or the low heart rate, alcohol use, volume depletions, if you have a pulmonary disease like asthma, COPD uncontrolled, and environmental factors like a warm environment and anemia. So remember you, you are, evolution or approach should include these things as well. So active standing is something you uh, you can do at the you know bedside level. So make sure that you uh, you know first you put the patient on a supine position then ask to stay stand up for three minutes and you take the blood pressures. So that will help you to you know, uh, you know determine certain things. So it's an important thing. So this active standing can be combined with, you know, there can be abnormal blood pressure response as well as an abnormal heart rate response. So uh, ECGs is very important. If you like, you know, I'm not, 
haven't for focused about you know or very obvious ECG changes like complete heart block. You know that the patient is that syncope is caused by that. But there can be subtle ECG changes. Remember that ECG changes can be intermittent, and most of the time the ECG is taken after the symptom. So it's important to get this concept into mind. That's called symptoms ECG correlation. So every time you have an ECG, likewise you verify the patient's identity with the ECG and try to match it. Make sure you need to match the patient's symptoms with the ECG as well. So if you get an ECG, then you have to you know look for clues which can be there or might point to that this patient suffered a syncope due to a cardiac reason. So you got biofascular blocks, interventricular conduction abnormalities. Uh, Mobile type 1, AV block, severe first degree, asymptomatic mild, inappropriate bradycardia. So non-sustained VTs, TVCs, so pre excited QRS complexes, long and short intervals. So we'll, I'll show you some ECGs. I'm sure you can see. So this patient is in sinus rhythm, normal PR interval. The axis has started to deviate. The subtle left axis deviation. You can see right bundle branch. So, there is some evidence of the AV node is intact, sinus node is intact, but the infranodal conduction tissue started to get disease. Left anterior hemifascial is blocked, the right, uh, right bundle branch is blocked. The conduction is totally dependent on the left posterior hemifascial. So this point towards having a uh, possible on, uh, complete AV block in years to come, time to come. So these are self explanatory and this is premature ventricular complexes not the contractions it's called so this is mild sinus bradycardia if, i'm not sure whether you can see there's free excitation here uh, yeah you can see that covert type of st elevation uh, in V1, precordial leads so suggest your Brugada pattern. And uh, here, obviously, uh, that's uh, if you can see that abnormal T waves with QT prolongation. Okay. So these are all subtle, subtle things that you might have to pay attention, you need to be aware. And this is called uh, form of six sinus, it's called sinoatrial exit blocks. Some P waves are not coming up. So here, it's called, if you can appreciate the short QT, and uh, then you can see uh, that is called a repolarization abnormality, subtle ST elevation in inferior leads. So uh, this has to be combined with that ambulatory rhythm monitoring. So the patient, most of the time the ECG was taken, it can be normal. So you will need long-term long rhythm monitoring, and you need cardiac structural imaging, including coronary imaging, and carotid sinus massage for patients who are more than 40 years of age, and head up tilt table test. And some will require EP studies and blood tests where clinically relevant. So you have to plan. Uh, just ordering for 24 hour monitor may not tell you the whole story. So you have to know, uh, you know, just do not ask, you know, uh, random holders. Yeah, you have to know that how you have to determine how frequently the patient is getting symptoms. The ordering halter for a person who's developing syncope once a year may not tell you anything. So you have to plan. Unfortunately, we are somewhat limited as to what we can provide you to. Now, the best, like you know, implantable roof, roof recorder uh, is so expensive. Uh, it's more than a million rupees. And so unfortunately, we are somewhat limited in the things that you can we can offer to you all in order to help up uh, to come up with the diagnosis but but just in case now some of these us our patients are carrying out smartphones or smart port beds rhythm monitoring can be done so make use of these things as well so educate your patient and uh, so if you suspect you know rhythm uh, related issues in terms of assessment now it depends on your symptoms you might ask the patient to do an exercise ECG so it's important that you reproduce your symptoms and then you do the ECG at the time. So that is the whole idea. So that's called symptoms ECG correlation. That is what we need to prove. And some patient obviously needed an invasive EP study. So we can measure, assess the cardiac electrical wiring and the functionality of it. And you may have to plan your you know, cardiac uh, structural assessment based on echo, 
uh, coronary angiogram and CT coronary angiogram, even cardiac MRI. So this orthostatic challenge, that is where the tilt table test has erupted. Now we know that when a person lying flat and go up on their feet. So at, as humans, we have evolved from lying flat and, and freeing our hands and stay up on our feet. So it changed the whole picture. The gravity is in place, the whole blood is pushing down. And uh, unless there is any compensatory mechanism, the brain is at the top, the most vulnerable location. So brain has to do something about to make sure that the brain gets sufficient enough of blood. So the, how does the brain do that? Through the autonomic nervous system that are being connected to the heart and the vascular. So the heart rate has to go up, the, the vessel tone has to go up to maintain the brain perfusion. So that is exactly what we do when we do the tilt table test. We put the patient to an orthostatic challenge and see how things behave. So this is what we do. We put some motorized table. You lie flat, put the patient flat on the table, then you up, up tilt at 70 degree, and then you continuously monitor the patient, patient symptoms, blood pressure, heart rate, ECG. So tilt table test is done for patient when you suspect. So it has a diagnostic value where uh, it is help us to uh, diagnose patients with reflex syncope or orthostatic heart tension or postural orthostatic tachycardia, even pseudosyncope patient. And it can also be used to as a therapeutic manual for patients. So because uh, the, it will allow the patient to understand his or her symptoms. So in most patients with syncope, especially reflex syncope, there will be a period where what we call prodrome. The patient will have a certain set of symptoms before it culminates into a full-blown syncope. So it is important that the patient will recognize those things and do modification to prevent it culminate into a full-blown syncope. So that can be done with the help of a tilt table. So we can educate the patient while the patient is on the table when the patient started to feel symptoms, what or she or he can do. And there's another thing called tilt training which is also a treatment model for certain uh, syncopies. So I'm not going to discuss how, how we are going to do the tilt. So the tilt response is where the patient will start to feel the symptoms. And you can verify with the patient, is that what you felt when you had your symptoms? So we can verify that normally when the brain started to get under perfect, when the systolic blood pressure below uh, 90, the patient will start to feel the symptoms. So the brain get under focus, the brain get agitated. So it starts, it sends signal down, patients start to feel sweaty, the vagal activations happen, patients start to feel nauseated, and the sweating happens, the palpitation happens, and then when the situatic blood pressure below uh, 60, the patient will be unconscious. And on the other, other end, the heart rate will also drop. So this is what happened exactly. So the, the heart rate initially stay up and actually it goes up a bit before it crashes down. And then, then the systolic blood pressure starts to down when, and then the patient will start to feel the syncope. And if you if you are if you have an EEG connected, you will see the EEG upsurge as well. So there can be, you know, uh, sometimes it is the heart rate that it drops or the blood pressure, if that drops normally, it can happen in combination. In, in autos, even the tilt table test can be helpful in diagnosing classic auto, autostatic hypertension as well. So there are three types of autostatic hypertension, early autostatic, classical autostatic, and delayed autostatic. And especially the classical autostatic or delayed autostatic can be easily diagnosed with uh, tilt table test. You can see that when a patient put up on the uh, till the heart rate should go up and it should settle as if the patient put back. So this does not happen. Uh, uh, this compensation will not happen if a patient to experience orthostatic hypertension. So remember, it is important that even people who are likely to have cardiac syncope can have till table test positivity. So tilt table test positivity may not rule out anything as well uh, because even a person with complete heart block can have vasovagal response because uh, uh, in complete heart block, the heart rate may not be sufficient enough to maintain the adequate perfusion to the brain in upright posture. So they will experience syncope and it will trigger vasovagal response as well. 
So carotid sinus massage is indicated for patients who are in more than 40 years of age having syncope because of carotid sinus syndrome in order to diagnose carotid sinus syndrome. Uh, this is how you do it. Normally, uh, we normally do it with, in combination with the tilt table test at the same time. So carotid sinus syndrome and hypersensitivity is a basically tilt table test uh, or the carotid massage based diagnosis. You would expect to see the patient to develop asystole for a certain amount of period that in harm can be, comes with the symptoms. So then you make that diagnosis. Some patient will require you know, uh, autonomic nervous system assessment as well. So a little bit about reflex syncope. It's called neurocardio inhibitory syncope. So my penultimate sp uh, speaker talk about brain heart syndrome. And this is reflex syncope is, is a mystery actually. It's an enigma no one is ever able to decide. We believe that this reflex syncope is a part of a maladaptation in our evolution. So we freed our hands, stay up on our feet. So brain is at a higher position. The gravity is pulling down things. So the, the, the theory that is postulated is that brain has a fail-safe mechanism to make sure that the, uh, the brain gets sufficient blood. It's actually the brain is pushing you down to it maintain the blood pressure to the brain. But in, having said so, the reflex syncope can have uh, various categories and I'm not sure we can appreciate it. So the higher centers is there and there can be a lot of triggers coming from various places can stimulate the higher centers in the brain, causing vagal upsurge, cutting down the sympathetic tone and causing vagal upsurge that is leading to drop in the heart rate and vasodilatation, causing the patient to pass out. So remember, if a patient come with syncope immediately, especially in emergency medicine setup, uh, ED setup, Patient come with syncope and having bradycardia does not necessarily mean that the bradycardia is caused by the syncope. It could be other way around as well. So that is called extrinsic bradycardia. Patient will experience reflex syncope and the heart, brain will create the bradycardia and that will be manifest on the ECG. So keep an open mind. So that bradycardia should get improved over the period of time. That is called extrinsic bradycardia. The true bradycardia is called intrinsic bradycardia, where the bradycardia is causing the syncope, where in this scenario, syncope is, as a result of the mechanism, it causes bradycardia. So what conditions can, you know, set of reflex syncope, the hemodynamic instability, and so GI symptoms, pain, abdominal pain, you know, defications, and even genitalitary symptoms like uh, triggers like you know micturition and higher brain functions such as emotions you may have seen some people even i remember as medical student days some of our colleagues when they first enter to the medical faculty to go to the dissection room or the theater they passed out that is a, a emotionally driven driven uh space of vehicle syncope So orthostatic hypertension, as we discussed, is about, it's a, basically it's due to the functional or structural impairment of the autonomic nervous system. And the body is struggling to adapt to the orthostatic challenge. So it is basically it start, so that can be central lesions or peripheral lesion causing, you know, uh, the, the, the failure to maintain the blood pressure in the upright position. So the, the patient will experience syncope. So it's chronotropic incompetence, hemodynamic triggers, so inadequate uh, vasoconstriction and lesions at the autonomic nervous system. So there can be early orthostatic, the patient might develop drop in blood pressure under one minute. The classic OH where the abnormal blood pressure response happened in three minutes. Delayed OH where the abnormal blood pressure response happened beyond three minutes. So there has to be, so I'm coming to the final parts of our talk. Uh, in that index admission with the patient comes with uh, transient loss of conscious and then you are certain that the patient develops syncope. So we have to answer three key questions. Is there a serious underlying cause that can be identified? This is where we talk about cardiac syncope. And what is the risk of serious outcome? So you have to understand this is a very individualized approach. And should the patient be admitted to the hospital? 
So we can identify high risk features. So if you take that think of an event, if the patient has knee wants and chest pain, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, headache, or abdominal pain, you should admit that patient. And if the syncope happened during exertion or supine, yeah, you better admit that patient and observe. If the syncope accompanies with sudden onset of palpitation, yeah. Uh, if the syncope happened without a warning symptoms, yeah, the warning symptom, absence of warning symptoms can be due to two things. One thing is actually there's no warning system. And the second is the retrograde amnesia. The patient might not be able to recall anything. And when the patient has a family history of sudden cardiac death. So uh, if you go through the past medical history, patients who have low risk, when the patient is having you know long history of recurrent syncope for decades and decades, it's somewhat unlikely for that patient to have a CD stomach. And in the absence of a cardiac disease, so you categorize them as low risk patient. Whereas when a person is having documented coronary artery disease, structural heart disease, or arrhythmia, you take them as high risk patient. And then you do your physical examination. If the patient is having unexplained low blood pressure and GI bleeding or persistent bradycardia below 40 or a systolic murmur, then definitely you need to have the patient. So, how would you treat syncope? It has to be uh, patient based and the etiology based. So, if you are to treat reflex syncope, remember reflex syncope cannot be cured. It's something that is hardwired into your body, and we don't even know exactly why it happens. So, only thing that you can do is to educate in a patient such a way that you allow, you empower your patient to recognize the impending syncope and do the modification to prevent the triggers coming up. So that is the way, that is the only way that you can do this thing. So patient education is very important that the patient should be educated about the diagnosis, that they should, should be able to recognize the situations and triggers and the patient should avoid dosing to that possible to whatever whatever the possible way. And the patient should be educated about the risk of recurrence. So remember sleep deprivation, physical exhaustion, uh, you know, febrile illness, dehydration, all these things, anemia, all can precipitate or trigger uh, reflex income. So a patient should be educated and, and, and should be taken measures. And make sure that fluid intake to remain at two liters. And now there's a huge how about you know cutting down salt. It is true for hypertension and cardiovascular risk, but when it comes to syncope, cutting down salt risk will increase the stroke uh, syncope risk. So I normally advise our patients, especially those who are not hypertensive, to maintain somewhat reasonable amount of salt intake. Because in theory, because the salt, salt is the one which holds the water together. If you do not take enough salt, the water will not stay in the circulation. So, and um, then depending on the you know tilt finding and the age, and uh, we have to tailor main our uh, treatment. So some patient might require like you know volume expand, like a few proportions so on. Uh, you know, and midodrine like alpha agonist, and some patients require very occasionally. So we hypertension and syncope together in blood pressure control. So try to ask them to maintain a systolic blood pressure so 140 range, and and try to minimize using diuretics, HCT like spironolactone like medication and advise them to use a long acting antihypertensives to control the blood pressure. Uh, that in com com combination with adequate hydrations and postural exercise. And some obviously require pacemaker implantation as well. So these are the simple counter pressure. So these counter pressure measures are prescribed when a patient has a prodrome. So if the patient can recognize so we advise if you are in a standing position, you see feel the symptom, the best thing is to lie flat. And if you are in a position that you cannot lie, you ask them to sit down and bend forward and do the hand stretch. So leg crossing, uh, hand fisting, these are all called counter pressure maneuvers. 
and hand stretch and even what we call butt clenching. So ask them to strain because the gluteal muscle contains a lot of blood and if you can push that blood into the circulation and improve the brain's circulation. And taking chilled water, uh, it improves symptoms quite rapidly. Uh, so cardiac spacing is indicated in certain scenarios where uh, patients develop significant bradycardia. And there is a novel method of treating reflex because that's called cardioneural ablations, where we ablate the ganglionic ganglions inside the heart. And it cut down the vagal stimulation to the heart. It actually certain heart blocks, certain bradycardias can be completely cured by cardioneuronal ablation without giving them a pacemaker. So orthostatic hypertension, you have to correct that, you know, abnormality. Sometimes not all that easy to, you know, to correct the auto autonomic nervous system abnormality. So you do to take measures to the minimize. So you ask the patient to do this postural exercise, lifestyle um, maneuvers, uh, lifestyle changes, you know, pro ask them to, you know, avoid seating for prolonged period and do the physical like, calf muscle strengthening exercises and may have to, you know, alter their medications, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, sometimes they will need uh, flutrocortisone as well. So cardiac treating? Five. Okay. So uh, cardiac rhythm syncope, obviously it's based on the rhythm uh, so if you have a SVT, you do the candida ablation on the medications. And if you have a VT, either you offer them ICD or you treat them with candida ablations. Bradycardia, obviously, uh, you treat them with uh, uh, pacing. So take home messages. So syncope is a common symptom and remember it's potentially lethal and elaborative taking is crucial and uh, it requires Evolution, keeping in mind that the sudden cardiac risk and uh, uh, patient can and have more than one etiology and treatment is highly uh, individualized. So poor outcome related to the severity of the underlying disease rather than to the syncope. Having a heart disease is the single most indicator of predict mortality and morbidity. Young patients with reflex syncope have an excellent prognosis. Uh, thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.